Kelteland is an island continent inspired by Ireland, Scotland, and other Celtic areas, such as the English county of Cornwall or the French province of Brittany. The word Keltland is derived from the combination of Celt, the branch of European people, and land. Keltland is commonly mispronounced as Celtland, but the important difference is that while a Celt refers to a person of Celtic background, Celt refers to a prehistoric type of stone that served as the head of an axe or other tool. Keltland's geography and weather also mirror its real counterparts, traditionally consisting of temperate climate and areas broadly made up of valleys, forests, caves, plains, mountains, and lakes. While some of this geography changed from events that transpired in the world's history, the rest of the country runs consistent with its real counterparts. The most distinguishing factor in this fictional world is the inclusion of magic and monsters. Magic is difficult to explain in detail, as Quest 64 lacks resources explaining its nature, but we can draw a few conclusions from our time with the game. First, magic is made up of the four elements of earth, wind, water, and fire, which directly impact the game world. So long as these elements remain in balance, Keltland enjoys relative harmony outside of human interference. Secondly, there are three beings with the capacity to harness the power of magic or wield it for their personal use. First are the spirits of Keltland, divided between the great spirits, of which there are four, and the many lesser spirits known as wisps. The four great spirits, one representing each of the elements of magic, either appears or can appear human, our example being the great water spirit named Lila, who protects the city of Lorapool. Interestingly, it's possible that all four of the great spirits are, in fact, beings resembling women, as the stained glass in the Melrod Monastery and the great stone carving at Limeland Manor both show four women with different elements crashing around them. The lesser spirits are wisps of air that appear to the main hero, Brian the Spirit Tamer. While their nature remains enigmatic, spirit tamers can see them, approach them, and form a pact with them to assimilate their power. Whether this is by their own choosing or not is difficult to ascertain, but this ability proves unique to spirit tamers themselves, and is presented as one of the reasons why the main character is able to grow in power so quickly compared to other magicians. Second are the monsters. While we never learn where monsters came from or their history, they have existed at least past the earliest point in Kellen's history that we know of, that being of Lavar's acquisition of the Eltail book 1,000 years ago. To this end, we can only assume that monsters have lived on Keltland for as long as humans have. Monsters vary greatly in their physiology, intelligence, and culture. To begin with, some species of monsters share similar traits to humans, possessing an equal number of arms and legs, standing upright, and even employing arms and armor, either stolen from traveling humans or made by themselves. Furthermore, some might even come from distinguished backgrounds in their respective cultures, such as frog knights and frog kings. Some monsters, however, are strictly bestial, such as wyverns and hellhounds, and even if some share similar appendages to humans, not all choose to use them to wield weapons and armor. We'll never know if monsters are working towards a goal when attacking humans, or if they do so out of survival or nature but all species of monsters share a willingness, or at least a tolerance, in working together for attacking humans. While the makeup of these groups depends on the area, there are themes in their grouping, such as monsters of the same species working together more frequently, or certain species, such as the Big Mouth, almost always exclusively hunting alone. Where monsters truly differ from humans are that they all show an innate talent in casting magic, they also may do so to a seemingly limitless degree, unless they choose to rely on martial combat or are otherwise robbed of their ability to spellcast. Where they appear to be hindered, however, is the variety of spells in which they know. Most appear to, at the most, have one or two spells at their disposal, and considering identical monsters all cast the same exact spells, I believe we can assume that monsters lack any capacity to learn additional magic and are only capable of what their species' background are born with. For as long as humans have lived on Keltland, kings, queens, and their respective kingdoms have come and gone. It's unknown if the present-day Kenneshire, Karma, and Highland 
existed during the day of grief, but current kingdoms and their people have existed at least long enough to carve out a reasonable existence in their varying locations. Humans possess the ability to trade, craft, fight, sail and fish, farm and herd, and more, and are only limited in their choosing on which skills the individual chooses to focus on or where their talents lie. Magic could be the only area where this is different for humans compared to other, more common skills. The majority of Keltland's humans are either unable to, or have no desire, to learn magic. One reason for this could be because that most people have settled in larger cities, and learning a means to defend oneself would have limited use over a more traditional, income-based trade. Even trades that require people to venture outside the safety of city walls, such as the clay diggers of Dondrin, or the traders and travelers staying at various inns across the land, may either be under protection of some of the city's soldiers, or could hire mercenaries or vagabonds to protect them. Lastly, magic may be exclusive only to certain people, or, at the least, is very difficult to learn. Brian is being trained by his father, Master Spirit Tamer Lord Bartholomew, at the Melrode Monastery, up until the game begins, and this serves as the only area in the entire game that we are made aware of sanctioned to train a type of spellcaster. The Melrode Monastery itself is noteworthy for several reasons. First, it takes inspiration from a functioning Catholic monastery in many respects. One clue is that, at least to some extent, it is self-sufficient, as there is an inner garden where food and herbs could be grown. Additionally, the monastery is filled with personal quarters for the monks, and a dining hall with a pulpit where a brother would read aloud from a tome while others ate, once again mirroring a traditional monastery of that period. There's also a main cloister for prayer, two separate lecture rooms and studies, a stable, and a private chamber for the Grand Abbot. Traditional monastery attire is a blue robe beneath a tan tabard with a clear crystal tied about the individual's neck, while higher ranking members dress more elaborately. For instance, Marmaduke, a fellow spirit tamer and guard of the monastery's entrance, has plated boots, gloves, a cape, and a type of bronzed helmet. Sirius, a high ranking monk, dresses more elegantly in fine black robes. The Grand Abbot himself is dressed the most lavish, with a grand white robe and a tall, pointed hat that seems to serve less purpose and function, and more in tradition. In the shadow of the mountain the monastery rests atop lies the quaint village of Melrode, a beautiful, peaceful town of people with humble professions. Since Lord Bartholomew left the monastery, the denizens have been left to rely on themselves for the defense of the village, and as a result, some villagers have taken up positions as watchmen in place of their traditional trades, such as Edgar. It's possible that Marmaduke also assists in defending the village, along with the monastery, but I leave that to speculation. While there isn't much else of note to discuss, one interesting design exclusive to this village is their local shepherd of sheep, who is unique to Melrode. Exiting Melrode, the Holy Plains are a stretch of green fields surrounded by coast that holds both Kenneshire's capital city Dondrin, along with Melrode and the monastery. Additionally, there's the Connor Forest, which serves as an important area for Dondrin, as it is where the city sends its diggers to bring clay to the city's artisans, who craft their famous pottery. The only other point of interest is a fortune teller's hut nestled against a pond well off the main road, and an isolated cabin situated between Melrode and Dondrin. Taking the main road south and west leads to Dondrin, which translates to Mole Castle from Irish. And while this may seem appropriate for the Earth-themed town, the mole being translated is that of the skin, not the animal. Dondrin is a fine castle town, surrounded by strong high walls and chimneys emitting lazy puffs of smoke in the backdrop. Most homes and businesses are seemingly built into the Earth itself, as the main road is cut through the hills that eventually lead up towards Dondrin Castle, where the hero, King Scottfort, protects the Earth Orb. The castle has detailed engravings built into its very stone, with the crest of the kingdom, a lion rampant, roaring in defiance, most likely a reference to the Red Lion of Scotland. There are several other standards decorating the halls and rooms of the castle, but the Black Lion of Kenneshire is a repeating theme. 
Connor Forest, the name Connor being a popular Irish given or family name, is a dark wood that serves as the primary gateway between the Holy Plains and the neighboring province, the Dondurian Flats. There are only two interesting structures worth noting here, the first being a hut that functioned as either a place of rest for the clay diggers during their excursions, or a storage facility for transporting goods to and from Dondurin. The other noteworthy structure is the abandoned stronghold deep within the woods, likely no longer maintained since Kennishire signed its peace treaty long ago with the other kingdoms. Passing through the Connor Forest, the player will arrive at the Dondurin Flats, which are a length of flatlands that can take one to the Glencoe Forest to the west, or the Dondurin Ferry clear to the south. The dock to the south will ferry travelers between the ports located at the Dondurin Flats, West Carmaw, and East Limelin, across the Great Lake, the Loch Kildary. Loch literally means lake, and Kildary could be the combination of Kildare, an Irish county, and Derry, which means oak grove. Glencoe Forest to the west of the flats is a dark, misty forest filled with dangerous monsters. Glencoe means Valley of the River Coe in Gaelic, and is also a real location in western Scotland. There is a young witch named Kelly who made her home near a block tunnel by a waterfall that fills the river going through the forest. Glencoe Forest is otherwise unremarkable, and serves no functional purpose in the story or the world as no one in Keltland mentions it as being useful. The ship that ferries passengers across the Loch Kildary and into Carmaw seems to be a popular source of travel, as an inn is located just outside of its docks for travelers coming to and from the province. Additionally, it could serve as a source of transporting Dondurin's famous pottery to other areas. We learn later in the story that there are pirates that skulk the massive lake, and this could explain why there are so few with the courage or skill to navigate the loch safely and evade potential undesirables. The ferry's first stop will be in West Carmaw, which could be named from the County Armagh in Ireland. West Carmaw is a beautiful, varied area of rolling green hills and rivers along with dense forests and expansive caves. Leaving the ferry and heading north will take the player to Larapool, the famous city of water, or should one head south, they'll reach Coal Hazard or the Windward Forest. Larapool has an interesting layout as it's built in a waterfall basin. Many buildings are packed tightly together on the small ledges of land around the outer rim of the basin, but on a personal level, I feel like this adds to much of Larapool's charm. A series of large stone bridges connects these plots of land together with a grand fountain erected in the center. Also, beneath the city and deeper into the basin is the Blue Cave, a massive series of snow and ice tunnels that's entrance is kept flooded by the water spirit and sorceress, Lila. Additionally, at the end of the massive cavern, there is a secret and an unexpected ally of Brian's waiting to be discovered. The Windward Forest and Coal Hazard to the south both serve as entryways to the village of Normoon. But the Windward Forest is the more popular choice, as it is less dangerous and has a more direct path to the village. Travelers owe much thanks to the twin brothers Jeff and Lloyd, who maintain the bridge that serves as the only way to enter the forest outskirts. Were it not for this path, Normoon's visitors would be forced to venture through Coal Hazard, a cavernous maze filled with deadly creatures and a blanket of dense fog. Luckily, directly outside Coal Hazard, a young woman named Dorothy offers those coming through a place to rest, should they require it. Regardless of the path taken, you'll eventually find yourself in the village of Normoon. Normoon is known for little beyond its grand windmills that are constantly grinding down grain by the druids that live there, and few are familiar with the wind jade buried within the forest by the druids long ago. I also believe that, while Normoon is within the borders of Karma, it functions autonomously outside of Karma's control. It is the only location in the game where no character makes a reference to a higher authority, and the people here also mention that should monsters raid their home, they would have no means to defend themselves now that they are all retired and are no longer capable of using magic, which could mean that Karma is not leaving any troops around to help defend the area. Because of this, I believe Normoon functions instead as an independent network of people. Returning to the ferry, 
there is one last area we should cover before we're sailed off towards our final dock. In the center of the Great Lock Kildury is a small plot of land known as the Isle of Sky. Here, the young sorceress Colleen lives alone to train in her magical abilities and protect the water sapphire. It is also worth noting that the Isle of Skye is in fact a real place, off the coast of Scotland. Moving on from the Isle of Skye though is the final docking point of our ferry, before it returns to the Dondurin Flats, East Limelin. East Limelin is one of the smaller provinces in Keltland, as it's an area surrounded by dense woods and tall cliffs. The road from the dock leads to two separate areas, the city itself of Limelin, or the Baragoon Mine. Limelin is known as the city of nobles and merchants, and its wealth and beauty are beyond dispute. Not only is the city beautiful, but it sits comfortably away from the mainland and is only accessible by a large bridge, and the city itself is surrounded by strong, high walls. Much of Limelin's wealth and prosperity may be attributed to three major factors. Queen Deanna, Lord Hoson Triker, and the prosperity of the Baragoon Mine. Queen Deanna proves to be a wise enough monarch that she leaves much of her affairs to the much-loved and well-respected Lord Hoson Triker, who manages the affairs of the city as well as the Baragoon Mine. While we learn little of Lord Triker over the course of the game, many of Limeland's citizens speak very highly of him, and we learn that he possesses and protects the Fire Ruby. Additionally, the Baragoon Mine has proved an ample source of wealth for Karma. And coupled with the country's talented merchants and tradesmen, the nation has seen unprecedented success, financially and economically. The only way we're able to progress to the next province, however, is through the mine itself, which begins as a maze of railways and mine shafts, but eventually turns into a series of ancient ruins. The miners dug so deeply that they eventually made a passageway between East Limelin and the Dindom Dries, via the ancient ruins they discovered, which unfortunately caused monsters to begin pouring into the mine. If one manages to progress through the ruins, however, they will find themselves near an archaeologist's tent in the Sea of Golden Sands known as the Dindom Dries, an unnatural area that breaks the consistency of Ketlin's geography and topography. It is a vast flatland of sands and cliffs created a millennium ago as fallout from the Day of Grief. But despite the lack of green in the area, the sole village that remains is still named Greenock, which could be a reference to Iceland and Greenland's names contradicting their environments. While this area is controlled by Highland, there is little to be taken advantage of in this harsh climate, so there is virtually no evidence of the nation's influence, seeing as the area is practically worthless. Should one have the will to wander through the desert, they'll be assaulted by wandering bands and monsters with no end to the vast stretch in sight. However, during our playthrough, we'll discover that this desert holds a great secret. Whether it's a trick of the desert's magic or truth, will be up to the individual to decide. The only way out of the Dindom Dries and into the final province in the game is through the Boil Hole, the most dangerous stretch of tunnels in all Keltland. True to its name, the Boil Hole has a constant stream of hot steam pervading the air, as the earth beneath trembles and shakes from the jets of air being blown from the ground. Rivers of magma flow lazily throughout, and only the toughest, hardiest of foes call this cavern home. At the end of the Boil Hole is a light that takes us to the final province in Keltland, Baragoon Moor. Baragoon Moor is a stretch of harsh plateaus in moorland with little to offer in terms of farmland and natural resources. Highland is still able to make out an existence here, however, and this could be attributed to factors such as cave vegetation or fishing, though this is only speculation on my part. Whatever the means of Highland's survival, it must be substantial as Brannock Castle Town serves as one of the most populated areas in Keltland. First, upon exiting the Boil Hole, is a construction base that also functions as a rest house for travelers. The construction in mind seems to be a large bridge that's being built over the boil hole, which could be Highland's answer to a safer way through to the Dindom Dries, or even to Limelin. Construction is halted, however, for an unknown reason, as the workers have returned to the castle town or left the area. Brannock Castle Town, Brannock being the name of a real Christian saint, is the reason Highland is known as the Kingdom of Fire and Sword. 
it is virtually impregnable, not only surrounded by a harsh geography, but with an outer wall and inner wall lined with cannons and other firepower, making assaulting the city nothing short of suicide. If that wasn't enough, there is a garrison situated directly in the town as well as an armory. If Highland's troops were stationed in the town as well as in the castle, this proves that the nation has no shortage of manpower willing to take up arms to defend their country. If even this wasn't enough, past Brannock's inner wall is a long stretch of isolated road to the great Brannock Castle, which sits high upon an ocean cliffside. Taking the road directly up to the castle would funnel the enemy directly into the castle's line of sight, and an attack from the ocean would be impossible thanks to the cliff it sits upon. Additionally, cannons were built into the very walls of the castle, which would make even reaching the front gate unfeasible. Should one manage to find themselves at the top of Brannock Castle, or perhaps even from the steps leading up to the mighty stronghold, the warrior king Bygus appears to have built a strange structure atop his castle. Is it a shrine of some sort, or something of darker intent? As this comprehensive study continues, the answers will present themselves, but perhaps some pages were meant to be left unread.